for being patient and the swarm of undergrads. You know, hopefully I have a midterm on Friday. I'm sure you guys understand the feeling. Desperately need to know what's going to be on that midterm, right? Desperately can't tell them, um, even though you want to. Uh, any questions before we start? Yeah. These slides are not online. Yes. Ah, the slides are online. Yeah. Yeah, I can post them then. Uh, yeah, send me an email to, sort of, to remind me. Okay. Any other questions? That's a good question. Cool. All right. Um, about the assignment, uh, how will it be graded? Um, the latest one will be submitted. Will be, um, I already answered this on the mailing list. The max score, your max score. Oh, max. Yeah. Okay, to go back. All right. So I looked it up. Reachable attacks are actually incredibly simple and uh, the basic idea is uh, destination unreachable can be that the hops, like you couldn't actually get the packet to the host, or one of the messages is, hey, that port, I couldn't uh, talk to somebody on that port. So the idea is if there's a communication between this 123 and this 56, right, if I guess what port they're talking on, I can send a destination unreachable ICMP message, spoof it as if it's coming from one end of the communication. And then when the other end receives it, it will terminate the connection because it thinks that it can't talk to that machine. Uh, which is actually pretty funny and weird because TCP and UDP have methods to do this, right? Mm -hmm. If you send a packet to a host that nobody's listening on, you get a reset or a thin packet, right? So, uh, but because of this, they actually, um, it allows you to dial and service the communication, right? So you think about this would be really bad if you do that constantly as soon as this connection is always made, they can't ever talk to each other. So that's what that is. Not anywhere near as complicated. Okay, so we talked about UDP. So somebody remind us, uh, what's so special, what's important about UDP, what layer, where are we at? Your hand up. Uh, we are at layer three. The numbers, I don't care about the numbers. Okay, we are at the transport layer. Above where? Above the internet layer. Yeah, above the IP layer, right? So we looked at IP, we looked at all the ICMP messages, and then we moved up into the uh, transport layer into UDP or TCP uh, mainly. So now we've looked at UDP. So what's some interesting things about UDP that we looked at? Just in general, like some of the features of UDP so we can context switch back into the stuff. Anyway? It's connectionless. It's right. done only over the with packets, and there is no guarantee that the packet will reach to the other. Right. So it's basically, and yeah, UDP boiled down, right, is uh, best effort. So no guarantees on ordering or delivery or repeated delivery, and it's just the packet. So we just send one packet, and uh, but the important thing, right, is that, that it uh, opened up this host. I'm uh, sorry, the port abstraction, right? So on one system, one IP address has. 65,000 uh, ports, right? And so any, you can send a packet to not just a, a UDP packet, not just to a host, but a host name at a specific port. So from a security perspective, right, we want to try to understand what ports are active on a given machine. And why do we want to know that? Is that why is that useful? So to know what's run, so we did, what, why do we do like a ping scan or an IP scan? So we do a ping scan, right, to see what hosts are up, right, to see what IP addresses are responding to pings, right? That tells us, gives us kind of the layout of the land to show us, okay, who's actually up. But a port scan, right, tells us what ports is that server listening on. Right, so why does this tell us what services it's actually running? So it's really just ports, right? It's just going to give us back some numbers. Right, because if you think about it, right, this is a, the internet architecture. If I want to talk to you on a specific service, a specific, in this case, UDP service, I need to know where to send. 
send that packet to what port to talk to, right? If I don't have knowledge of that, how are we ever going to be able to communicate? Do I just try all 65,000 ports on your machine and hope that I get the one? Uh, no. And so there's a standard, right? So there's a standard definition of that map ports to services. Um, so if we're using this, we can do, if we can scan that system to see what ports it's listening on, that will give us an idea of what software is running on that machine. <coughs> uh, why is that important? Hey, 
this port is unreachable. I couldn't get a message there. Uh, so then it keeps track. So it says, OK, that means 134 is probably closed. Um, and it'll kind of do this and say, OK, 40 is closed, 31 is closed, 32 is closed, 53 is closed, 49. Let's see, where are we at? Yeah, so you go, so basically the, where you, but is this any guarantee that those ports that it says is open are actually <coughs> open? What's an alternative? Like how reliable is this, right? We gotta, this is um, part of what I want you to learn about why things are happening, right, at this low level is, yeah, it's really easy to just use this tool, right? You can use Nmap, you can go online, read some tutorials, right? But to actually understand how it's doing it, that way you can interpret the results that it's giving you back, right? So if it says that a host is, is open, what does that mean from here, from these, kind of these traces? That it did not throw back an ICMP added message? Yes. Right? It didn't, we did not receive one of these ICMP port unreachable messages. Does that mean that that port is open and something is listening there? No. no. Yeah, it might have gotten lost, right? Uh, it could have gotten lost. That ICMP message could have got lost. Maybe we accidentally uh, sent too many packets and so it just dropped that error message. Maybe the network's congested. Maybe the network's busy, right? ICMP is an IP level packet, so it has absolutely no guarantee of delivery or anything like that. Um, so yeah, so that's just something to keep in mind, right, about how is this actually, this tool actually working so that I can interpret those results correctly. Because you could run these results again and get a completely different output. Or maybe not completely different, but maybe slightly different, right? So you need to know how to interpret that. Uh, questions on UDPs and UDP port scanning? Yeah. Uh, there's an NMAP uh, step scan. Yeah, we'll look at that with, do, does it do stealth with UDP? I actually don't remember. No. I don't think so because it's, um, I think one other way you can use, we'll see when we look at TCP, we'll see that there's a bunch of different ways to try to do this to be more stealthy. Um, but that has to do specifically with how TCP is implemented. Um, but for UDP, yeah, that'd be interesting. Anybody know? Anybody, if you happen to look it up, let me know. That would be interesting uh, to find out if they're stealthy. But yeah, you could be, I mean, you don't talk about stealth, right? Uh, you could be pretty stealthy if you, if the time in between sending these packets is on the order of days, right, or weeks, right? You still get the information about what ports are open, but do you think they're gonna look at every UDP port and every ICMP port closed message? Probably not, right? So yeah, stealth has a lot to do with, uh, lot to do with time, right? So it's kind of like a, a function of what traffic you generate and how that traffic looks over time. Um, cool. All right, so now we move on to the main event in some sense, uh, TCP. So what's TCP besides transmission control protocol? Like what, what are we, what's interesting about TCP? What are some of its properties? And compared to UDP, what are the differences? level, right, we can use a TCP, we know we're going to create a connection to another server, right, and then we know that we have some guarantees that our data gets to the other side, right, we can actually know that our data got there, we'll know that it got there in order, um, and that there wasn't any retransmissions, at least from the application side, when the application gets that data. Um, yeah, so we kind of actually is very uh, nice because it provides this on top of this unreliable IP connection, right, it provides reliable delivery. Uh, well, not delivery, but a reliable connection. So uh, specifically, there's, you know, there's no, there should be no loss of packets, no duplication, no transmission orders, uh, correct ordering. 
right? Does it, does it guarantee that your packets are actually going to get, like, the, the connection is going to be successful? <coughs> does it? Do you guarantee that you can send TCP data to anybody, any IP? No, right? So you could not get to them. What happens if you're in the middle of a TCP connection and your Wi-Fi shuts off, right? So, but the point is, is that you know, whereas in the case of UDP, right, you just send out a packet and you never know that something bad happened, right? This way you can actually know that the other host, you either couldn't establish that connection or you never got an acknowledgement of the data that you sent. Uh, so this is kind of the key thing here. And TCP also has the port abstraction. So this is why ports are, are so very important. Um, so the, when we talk about a connection, what's involved in a connection between two hosts? Anybody, how do we define a connection between two hosts in TCP? The source port and the destination port. Source port, destination port. Source port, protocols, and the encryption thing, like. The no encryption in TCP. Hmm. No encryption. Yeah, but they look for the, like, what sort of service or port protocol. Ports, yeah, we talked. Source port, destination port, what else? Is that it? I Three-way handshake, so that's how we establish a connection, right? But what defines a connection? Port and IP. IP. IPs, yeah, that's the other thing, right? Source source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port, right? This is a four-tuple that defines a connection. So this is how, when you communicate from one uh, client to the other, this is how you, both sides know that this connection is unique, because they use this four-tuple. Um, so we can call it a, a virtual circuit, right? We have abstractly a circuit between us so we can transmit data and information across there. Uh, this is an important thing. So source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port. And uh, you know some other stuff, right? We can both talk on this connection. So we can send data, and the other side can send data back to us. Um, so yeah, you can also you refer to it as a socket, as a IP address port number. Okay, so let's look at the uh, TCP header uh, because it's going to give us some kind of important information about how it operates and what it actually looks like. Uh, so we have source port, destination port, right? These are the important things at the TCP level. Where does source IP and destination IP live? Next. IP, next. IP, yeah. It's, it's in the layer below us, right? So at this layer, we actually don't know uh, what that is. Uh, the next is going to be a 32 bit sequence number. We're going to look at explicitly how that works. Uh, then we have a 32-bit acknowledgement number. Uh, we have the length of the header, if there's any um, a field indicating the length, if there's any options. Uh, we have some reserved fields, flags that we'll see that are important. Uh, we have a window, which is also very interesting. Uh, then we have a checksum, uh, an urgent pointer that's supposed to say that this is really urgent to send. I don't know that anybody actually uses this anymore. Um, any kind of options, then some padding, and then finally the data of the of the packet. And so, right, so we go back to encapsulation. So this is the beauty of networking, right? That TCP packet is encapsulated inside of an IP packet, and that IP packet is encapsulated inside of a frame header, right? So at each layer on the local network, right, that frame header is ripped off, and then a new frame header is added when it gets sent out on another physical medium. It hops all the way through until it gets to your application, where the application gets the data once the connection is established. Questions, TCP? Cool, okay. So how we actually make a connection, right? So this is something that is critically important because unlike UDP, where we could just send a packet to somebody, anybody, right? And they just have to receive it and decide what to do with it. In TCP, we're actually establishing a connection between people, uh, two machines. And so the idea is we use these sequence and acknowledgement numbers in order to specify, so if you think of it as a stream of data between two machines, right? these sequence and acknowledgement numbers basically say where the data should be in this stream. And the acknowledgement numbers are a way for the other side to say, hey, I've got the data up to this point so that we can know if they've missed something or if they've not missed something. Um, if I hope this is kind of review-ish for you. If you get caught up in here, this is a really critical issue, so you should, you know, TCP rules everything, so you should study, you know, 
understand how it works. Um, so the idea is the sequence number or the sin, uh, the sequence number means that uh, is the position of the data in this TCP packet. And so it means that from there to the length of the header. So in this case, uh, let's see, can I do this in my head? 32, no, 35, 35 bytes, is that right? Difference between there? Math. Okay. They never told me in school I'd be doing math in front of a bunch of people. Uh, okay. Right? So this means that, okay, in this segment, this is data from byte, you know, 13, 4, 23 to this byte. Um, and then when we send this out, essentially the other side is going to act back and say, uh, hey, I've, uh, this is one of this example doesn't follow. Yeah. But the acknowledgement number means that, okay, whatever it is, if it's 16753, it means that I've received up until that number minus one. I've received up till byte 16753. And so I expect your next thing that you send to be 16754. Right? So this is the way we're able to, each side can know what the other side has seen. Right? We can know if there's problems dropped or anything like that. Um, and so this is how all of the, re if anything's lost, we handle it this way. If any packets are duplicated, the other side, one of the sides will drop it because it's already seen and acknowledged that data. Uh, we can do some cool stuff with flow control, which we're not gonna go over, so we try not to overload the network. Um, the window size is actually very interesting. Uh, so the window was that, I think it was a 16-bit field, right, uh, half a word in the header. And basically, uh, it says, essentially the way I think, kind of think about it, it's the size of the buffer of the receiver that says, okay, this is how much data I can accept for you to send. So basically, from the sequence number plus the window size, that's how much data I can send, or actually it'd be the acknowledgement number. The acknowledgement number plus the window size, that's where you can send me data, right? Which is actually, when you think about it, a very forward-looking feature because if you think about mobile devices and embedded devices, right, that maybe have smaller hardware constraints, right, they can't accept if you're just Google and you just slam a bunch of data back at them, uh, you're gonna get a lot of drop packets. So this is a way to, each side can actually tell each other, hey, this is how much data you can send me. Um, and this can, yeah, it can be changed, it can change on conditions. Um, so the TCP flags are where it gets really important. So these uh, allow us to specify certain properties of the packet. Um, and specifically the flags we're gonna be interested in here are all going to be about how we actually establish this virtual circuit, right? Between source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port. Um, so a SYN, so a SYN flag means that we're requesting a synchronous, it's used in connection setup, so we'll, we'll see that. Uh, stands for synchronization SYN. Um, so when we say, when I say something like a SYN packet, right, is, that, is there, it's not really such a thing as a SYN packet, right, it's just a TCP packet with the SYN flag set, right, so it's just one bit. Uh, the other bits of the flags, uh, the ACK bit is the acknowledgement number is valid, um, thin, the thin flag means uh, I want to shut down, so I'm not going to talk to you anymore. After I send a thin packet, it means I'm not going to send you any more data. And we have a two-way connection, so this is how you can stop connection in one way, basically. An RST, a reset, is a request to basically like, hey, something went horribly, horribly wrong, we should stop and start over because I don't know what you're saying or something horrible happened. Um, <coughs> Urgent uh, has to deal with the urgent pointer. I really don't think this is ever used. Um, the push is interesting. It basically allows the client to request that the data be pushed up from the TCP stacks buffer into the application layer. So it means that, hey, the application really should get this rather than you waiting for more and more data and then giving it up to the application layer. Uh, so this actually is used, which is kind of interesting. Okay, so SYN packet has a SYN flag, a SYN ACK packet, right? When I say something like that, it means the SYN flag and the ACK flag is set. Uh, a reset packet, a FIN packet, right? These are all just flags, right? So just 
to make sure we're all clear. Any questions on this? Hopefully not crazy new. All right. So how do we set up the, ver the circuit between two ports and two IP addresses, right? So this is what becomes critical to security, right, is how this process actually happens. Um, so this is what people have been talking about, right, the three-way handshake. Right, so a high-level idea of what happens. What does that mean? Do we have like, like a being with three arms just like shaking <laughs> hands? It seems like a misnomer, right? We only actually have two hosts, so how can we have a three-way handshake? Like, how? So how does it work? Somebody want to give us an overview? Okay. We send a sim, then an ask, and then a demand. Yeah, so we, so basically it means three-way as in three communication. Right, so we send a SIN that says, hey, I want to talk to you on this port. They send a SIN act back, and then we send an acknowledgement back, and after that three steps, then that virtual circuit is connected, and we actually have a way to communicate between the two hosts. Um, but until that, we don't actually have anything. But from a security perspective, we can't just think at a high level, right, because we want to know how it's actually built, so that we can see how to mess with it and how to change it for malicious purposes. So the idea is a client wants to make a connection to a specific machine on a specific port, and so it's gonna send a SIN flag, and the SIN, the sequence number is gonna be a random, so it's a 32-bit number, right? The sequence, it's the whole word in the header. Um, it's gonna be some random initial sequence number. We'll call it S underscore C. So if the server wants to actually accept this connection, Right, it's going to send back a flag with this. It's going to send back a SYNAC packet, and it's going to create its own random sequence number. Right, because we have two ways of communication. Right, so this allows basically. Um, so they both kind of choose some random offset of 32, and it's both saying, "Okay, this is going to be zero for us." So that way, when I send you additional sequence numbers above that, you know where that data goes in relation to this initial sequence number. Right? But both sides have to do this because data can go has to be able to go both ways. So it has an initial random sequence number, and then in the acknowledgement field, right? What was the acknowledgement field for? The almost. Data, the sequence number that the other side is expecting, right? So it's received data up all the way to that point. So from this perspective, from the server's perspective, what's the next bit of data that it's expecting from the, the what's SC of the acknowledgement packet? The same SC, SC plus one. So why plus one? This always this confused me. I think it wasn't for like multiple years until I finally got a good answer for why it does plus one. So one, one explanation is, well, it's exactly what I told you, right? I told you the acknowledgement number is acknowledging the next packet that you're expecting, right? So I told you, give you a SIN, and I tell you the sequence number is 10, so then you would tell me, of course, I'm expecting 11, right? Because that's what the acknowledgement number means. But the protocol doesn't have to be designed like that, right? It could be designed as, instead of the packet I'm expecting, just tell me the byte of the last thing that you got, right? Mm -hmm. So why plus one? Reduce the number of transmissions or messages. Um, I don't know. You have to sh prove to me that it actually would reduce it, right? I don't know. I can't show that. Maybe it does. Probably some networking people in here, right? What's the size of the acknowledgement numbers? 32 bits, and the size of the sequence numbers are also 32 bits, yeah. right? Um, how do we represent, how do we interpret those bits into a number, right? So we have to interpret this as a 32-bit number, right? So what are the different, so if we just have a series of bytes or sequence of bits, right, how do we interpret that as a number? Is there only one way to do that? No. How many different, like there's probably a million different ways. Uh, but there's like two main ways, right? Little endian and big endian, yeah. yeah. right? And that actually doesn't change the bit order, it changes the order of the bytes. 
So basically it says, okay, I have uh, how many bytes there? Is it four bytes? Four, four bytes? Four. Yeah. So I have four bytes. Is the least significant byte on the left or is the least significant byte on the right? Right? Because I can interpret it either way. So what this actually does is it proves, so on, I believe, most hosts, uh, like x86 is little endian, uh, but network, on the network, it's actually big endian. So this shows that the other machine and you are speaking the same language before you make a connection, right? That the other side actually correctly interprets your number that you sent and gave you back that number plus one, right? Because if they tried to send you that number, if they tried to interpret the number, add one to it, but had the bytes in the other order, you're gonna get a completely different number back, right? So this actually is kind of like a cool, it's almost like a built-in debugging check into the protocol, um, and, that's, and you know, that's like specifically why they did this. So if you just echo it back without doing any computation, well, anybody can do that, right? You just take whatever you're given and you throw it in the acknowledgement section. Uh, but this proves that you can interpret it, so I don't try talking to somebody who doesn't know how to speak the network language. Okay, so when the client gets back this synapse, Right, comes back to the client. So what's it going to send back to the server? So it's gonna send back an act and says, yes, I got that. So what's the sequence number of that going to be? S, the sequence number of the client, SC plus one, right? Yeah, it's the client sequence number and the acknowledgement number is going to be SS plus one, yeah, exactly. Right? And after we get this, now we're in business and we can send data back as long as we increment the sequence numbers correctly and the acknowledgement numbers correctly. So, we haven't really gone into the security implications here, but what kind of choices have, are made here? See, like, so after you decide that you wanna to talk to somebody, what kind of choices are being made? Like SC and SS, right, are both, so I just said random. It's kind of a weird thing to put in a standard, right? Now you're gonna come up with a random number. You have somebody typing away furiously, right? So what, how do we choose this initial sequence number? Um, and so the TCP standard tried to specify that the number should be changed every four microseconds, it should change. Um, Initial systems used a different way of, I don't know, trying to increment it every once in a while, and every time you got a connection, you change it too. Um, we'll see in a bit how this actually can affect the security of this entire operation. But part of the problem is that nobody really specifies how you do it, right? How do you get this random sequence number? But it's like, oh, yeah, you just increment a number, right? That should be fine. So let's look at this three-way handshake from the client to the server. So what's the first uh, packet when the client wants to talk to the server? Sin, yes. So you can see here that we have, uh, so what are these two at the top? Ports. ports, yeah, so we're saying to port 22 from port 13987. Why 13987? Why don't I send it from port 22? is kind of funny, right? So we want to talk to port 22, right? But because of that four tuple, right? Source, source port, destination IP, destination port, destination IP, right? Because of that port in there from the source, we need to make sure that that source is essentially kind of unique, but it's not something that somebody incoming could talk to. So usually we just choose a random high number port, and that's kind of how it works. Uh, but it, it looks a little weird because when you look at this, you're like, well, of course, port 22, well, I say of course, is it SSH? I want to say it's SSH, right? Yes, okay. Uh, it's SSH, right? It's coming from some random port, so when you look at it and you see that on the next one, we're gonna send random traffic back to a random port, the only reason why it's important is this four tuple of client, source, port, server, source, uh, server, source port, that's what's important. So if we make another connection, a concurrent connection to server to that same port 22, right? we know that it's different if the 
the source board is different. If the source board's the same, then it's everybody considers that to be the same connection and the same traffic. Okay, so we send that. We set uh, the sequence. So we set we just generate a random six five seven four. Uh, we set the sin flag to one, which means that this is a sin packet. The server gets this packet, right? And of course, we're missing all of those crazy hops in the middle when the packets trans you know, transfer out of our subnet into the other network and hops on the gateway, all that stuff. But let's say that it gets there, right? Uh, so then what does the server send back? A sin and an act. So sin's going to be one, act's going to be one. What's it going to put in the sequence number and the acknowledgement number? Sequence is going to be newly generated random. Sequence is going to be what? Newly generated random. Yeah, so a newly generated random number, what's the act going to be? Yeah, 6575, right? That number plus one. And the port numbers are switched, right? Cool. Uh, then the client gets this. So the client responds, right? And says, okay, act, so sin, sin act, act. Uh, it says, okay, so same port numbers, right? We change the port numbers, and none of this would work. Uh, we use this, uh, the sequence number, six. 575, uh, which was our original sequence number plus one, and then we acknowledge their, the server sequence number by adding one to it. Right? And now we've established a connection. So now if any side wants to send data, they send the sequence number, they send some data, and the other side acknowledges that whatever the previous sequence number was plus the data, basically. Uh, so we can actually see this in a TCP dump trace, right? So what are these? Yeah, our old friend ARP, yep. right, ARP. So we first, uh, so I guess these two these two machines are on the same subnet, yeah, which makes sense, 192.168.10.192.168.20. Uh, <coughs> We're trying to SSH there. So we set a SYN packet, and we have this sequence number, 101.54, 101.5043. And so dot 20 is going to do a sin, so it's the sin flag and the ACK, right? So we have a sin ACK packet back from 20 at port 22 to 10 at port 1026. Um, and so it's acknowledging, we can see here, it's acknowledging this plus one, right? Whatever that random thing is, plus one. And it's giving us a new sequence number, right? So now the client has to respond back with an ACK and acknowledge that sequence uh, that, uh, yeah, this uh, sequence number that was sent. Uh, 405657799. Yeah, I'm not gonna say it. This one. Okay, yeah. Please. I have two questions. One is that Only you one. <laughs> oh. oh, okay. <laughs> so, first question is you said we needed a port tuple to uniquely identify a connection, but yes. then here we see that only the port numbers are sufficient to say. So, Only the port, well this is because we're only looking at this specific trace, right? But for each host on each side, right? When they get a TCP packet come, that comes in, right? They need to map it to what connection because you're having multiple TCP okay. connections all the time. Um, so the way each host decides is it looks at that port tuple to know what connection that is. Um, the same way when you're mainly looking at it on the network. Mm -hmm. At the same time, if another IP uh, sends, I mean, another host sends a uh, packet to this particular port, then. Yeah, so if you have two people SSHing into this machine at the same time from different hosts, mm -hmm. right, or even the same host SSHing concurrently to this machine, you'll see the same SYN, SYNAC, ACK, but with different client uh, port numbers or IP if they're different. Oh. You'll probably see different client IP and client ports. So it's randomly generated. Yes, question two. Yeah, the question two was that what happens if the uh, destination actually uses the other Indian format uh, apart from the one I use and send a plus one and I get a different number here? I believe in this, when it gets that, uh, dot 10 would send a reset and it should be like, we should never talk to each other ever again. Okay. <laughs> and you get some weird error. Um, yeah, that'd be interesting to look at what actually happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so once we've established, <coughs> yeah, please. Uh, what would happen if uh, 32-bit number overloads? Ah, 
so yeah, actually that's a good point, right? So the sequence and acknowledgement numbers, right, are 32-bit numbers. Um, so if we add one to it, right, and we're at the end, it could go over, or if our data is large, we'll go over. Uh, it's totally fine. They actually specify that you do modular arithmetic. Um, so it's, you're basically, so yeah, you gotta think of the sequence numbers are like somewhere, start somewhere in the thir two to the 32-bit range, and they, during the connection, they increase, and if they go over, you just keep going. Um, the window size kind of makes sure that it's never going to be bigger such that you have packets outstanding that you don't know where they go. So the window size specifies from the current thing, how much farther could I send at once? Uh, so that makes sure that you can't, you don't have to worry about that. That's a good question. Yeah? Maybe I missed it, but how does uh, an application on the TCP layer get the IP? Is it? Ah, you have to know. Yeah, so uh, you either, I mean, DNS is the, Real answer, right? So uh, you actually, like the way it actually works, right? You type in google.com into your browser, it makes a DNS request, which is a UDP request. So built in, it has to know, so it has to kind of bootstrap, right? To know what DNS server to contact. So it's either hard coded or DHCP specifies what DNS server to use. Uh, so in the TCP packet, let's say that the source, I send a TCP packet to the server. Mm -hmm. By the time the server receives the packet, it just has the TCP data with it, which does that have the IP also, like which source IP has sent me this? Ah, um, so inside, the inside TCP data there will be the IP. You can, oh. yeah, you can, because, so you get a socket from the operating system, right? Uh, when you get a connection. So basically the OS keeps track of that socket number and that four tuple, right? So when packets come in, it knows what socket those, that data is for based on that four tuple. Then it knows from that mapping, when you read from that socket, it knows what data to give you. Um, and then there's also ways to query the socket to say who's on this IP address, right? Who's, I think you can, yeah, in C it's like remote address or something like that, there's a way to do it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but yeah, thinking about it, if you just kept the TCP layer, you actually don't know who you're talking to. But you know that every time you write out to that socket, that you're writing to the same person that's sending you that stuff. Right? Even if you don't know who it is or what IP they are, you know it's the same connection. Cool. Any other questions? TCP questions? Sure. Interesting question. I'm going to try to break my brain. Uh, okay. So now we want to, we've established a connection. Now we want to actually send some data. So if you think about it, so what's the overhead here? Yeah, so for every time we want to make a TCP connection, we have to do these three round trip packets, right? And round trip means from me, well, I guess it's not round trip, round trip would be back, but uh, a single trip, right? So it goes from me to you, from you back to me, and then from me back to you. So uh, you have to, yeah, two, three, okay. Um, right, so that could be a pretty long latency if you're, if one of your hops, if you're on like the International Space Station and you're trying to like talk to people on Earth, right, anytime you do this, it's gotta do the three hops. Um, uh, okay, so now that we've established that, now we wanna actually start sending some data. Um, so every time we wanna send any TCP packet, Basically, we're gonna say, if we wanna send data, we're gonna say our, the previous acknowledgement, uh, the previous sequence number of that start of that packet, right? So that's where that data should go in the stream. And then we also will send an acknowledgement number that acknowledges what the last thing that we got from the other side was, right? What that sequence, what byte we're expecting, right, from the other side. Then, when the partner gets that packet, assuming it's within that window size, right, and we didn't try to send some too much data, um, then it will acknowledge that and it will add that to its buffer and then send us a, basically an empty segment. So it's a TCP packet with zero data that says, hey, I acknowledge, and the acknowledgement number will be this new packet sequence number plus one, right, that says, I got this. And so we know, so this is the case of, what's well, up? Let's look at this. So now we, um, the client can send it to the server, right? So we've established a connection. So I say, hey, this is, um, 
Sequence number 6575, 2422. I'm acknowledging that the last thing I saw was 7612, and I'm gonna send 25 bytes. So then what's the server going to send back as its acknowledgement number? 65. So it's not 76, right? 76 means that's the last byte I got, right? So the last byte we have is 6575 plus 25 bytes plus one. Right, so it'll say, yeah, acknowledge, is that correct? No, there's plus one. No, it should be a plus one there, yeah, you're right. Should not be plus one. It's correct. Hmm. Oh, so you're checking. We check the little Indian and big Indian only during the handshake and not after that. No, it should be the same. But then, uh, but is this number plus one? Is the sequence number yeah. SC plus one? I need to look at this more carefully since I made a big deal about the plus one. <laughs> <laughs> basically add the size of the data. The important part here is that the delta is the data. Uh, if it should be plus one, yeah. The first one is not a string packet, so maybe that's why they don't have plus one to get the acknowledgement. Um, so we have to, the sin is uh, synchronization. It's only ever used when we initiate a connection. Um, we have to, we have to, so the sequence number specifies how we tell the other side where this data goes. Um, so basically we're telling them, just like fragmentation, right, has an offset for each of the fragments, this says, hey, at 6575, so if you take the initial sequence number, uh, if you take this number, right, subtract the initial sequence number, that's how many bytes into the packet that this data goes into. And it's specifically 25 bytes, yeah. Probably the connection is already established, yes. and the client is asking server to acknowledge 25 bytes. Yes. Correct. So yeah, that's so. Yes, that's so where we are. So we've already established the connection, right? We just saw six six five seven five to six five seven nine is actually twenty five bytes, not six five seven zero or six six zero zero. Say that again. Six five seven five yes. to six five nine nine is twenty five bytes. No, it's so it's actually eight. expecting six six zero zero. Wait, what? No, 6575 plus 25 is 55. No, but including the No, you can't overwrite the 75 uh, byte six, with the new byte. Byte. The number of numbers between 75 and 25. Oh, including that, the 75th byte. Yeah. 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 Yes, we can. okay, that does make sense. Okay, good. Yes, that's why we have all of you. Okay, yes, that does make sense because that is where the next byte goes, right? It's the, the last thing I sent plus one, right? So I sent you all the way up to byte 6575, or 6574 is where I sent it up to. So now I'm gonna send all of this, this next 25 bytes are gonna be bytes 6575 all the way up to 6599. And then the next byte we're expecting is 6600, the other side. Ooh, gets tricky. Try not to write the TCP IP stack. Really stack. Uh, when we're sending the 25 bytes, uh, is it like getting added by the server and then sent back or else like, because if we are able to add 25 bytes, one would not be a difference. Like, you know, if, if we just do, I mean, if we just do 6575 plus 25, uh, uh, that, Plus one might not be necessary because we, we already know how to add up to six five. We always do the plus one because we always do the next, I mean, we always do the byte that we're expecting. Okay. Yeah. Might confuse everything too, but what happens when you send a zero byte? Ah, we'll see that. Um, good. Uh, okay, so yeah, let's look at this. So we can actually respond, right? So we know we're responding this 6600 means that we've actually received all of those 25 bytes, right? So now, at this point, now the other side knows, the client knows, hey, that other side, the server got my 25 bytes, right? This is how we know that that was delivered and delivered successfully. Um, but the server can also re reply with data, 
right? So it can reply in this case with 30 bytes. So let's see if we can all do this correctly. Uh, let me check and make sure this adds up. No, I don't think it adds up. I think we may have done it. Something in here is not consistent. Should be 42? Oh, yeah. OK, good. That is what we said. Consistency. All right. So it's going to be, yeah, the sequence. So right, so here, but here this is a zero byte uh, sequence, uh, a zero byte TCP packet, right? So we have acknowledgment as one, and we're saying, hey, we've acknowledged, we've seen up to 657642. Up to 7641, and I'm expecting 7642. And uh, I have sent you basically up to 66599. Right? That's how many bytes I've sent you, is what this sequence number says. And because the length is zero, so if they just kept saying, yeah, I got your package that's length zero, yeah, this is what I'm expecting, right? We'd have a silly connection we could talk forever. Uh, so when it gets a zero byte, it doesn't respond. Uh, so that's what happens here. So we get that, and then we say, okay, both sides know that everything's good. We know we're exactly where we're supposed to be. Um, so, oh, shoot, we went over time. Ah, sorry. All right. Numbers and addition. Oh, cool. Yeah. So we're going to go into some cool attacks and stuff that happens in TCP.